welcome to TPR Live. My name is Aaron Lind. I'm star tutor here at the Prince and Review. And this evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you're at, we'll be talking about the hardest SAT writing and language and ACT English questions. So first of all, because I know we always get this sort of question whenever we do topics that kind of apply to one test, do they apply to the other? And the answer is for the most part, yes. Now there's gonna be certain questions that you won't see nearly as often on one of the tests versus the other. For instance, here we got a SAT question from uh, the official guide practice test eight. You don't see these questions terribly often on ACT, though most of the SAT practice tests have similar questions, but the sort of skills that both the SAT and the ACT test really do overlap quite a bit between the SAT's writing and language section and the ACT's English test. And so as we're going on tonight, do keep that in mind. These things are applicable to both tests. Now certain tests, one of the tests might like one of the topics more than the other, but that doesn't mean that you won't necessarily see that topic and it doesn't mean that you should be tuning out every question that I do because we'll be mostly going back, just back and forth. So as I said, here we have this SAT practice test question. And those of you who've done some SAT practice probably already know like, oh yeah, this is the sort of question we see quite a bit. And these questions can be tricky, especially if you don't know what they're asking. So the question to make this paragraph most logical, sentence five should be placed. Okay, so straightforward enough in how the question is phrased. Let's put sentence five either where it is now or somewhere else. Now the trap and the thing that makes this a difficult question, if you don't know what's going on, is that you feel like I need to reread this entire paragraph four different times, once for every place that sentence five would be, and then see, okay, which one sounds the best, which one makes the most sense, is the most logical, I mean, whatever that means. And so one of the things I wanna to emphasize tonight is that there are a handful of concepts that get tested over and over and over again on both the SAT and the ACT. And they may be tested in many different topics, but the concepts go across. And the big concept we're looking here, and perhaps the most important concept across both tests, is, is we need to be consistent. In a question that's asking you to move a sentence, we need to be consistent with the ideas that come before and after that sentence, wherever we end up having to move. So now, with this sort of question, we're gonna read the sentence and we're gonna look for a clue in that sentence. And a clue in the context of a question like question 19 is a word or a phrase that tells us what should come, typically what should come before the sentence. Sometimes we get better clues coming what comes afterwards, but we're gonna look at the sentence. We're gonna start by reading sentence five and seeing what sort of clue we get. So their older counterparts, yellow and white lines, dance more slowly and deliberately. Now, there are actually a number of clues in this sentence, but the first one that I wanna point out is actually the very first thing there. When we're moving these sorts of sentences, we're first thing we're going to look for is some sort of pronoun that refers to what comes before or afterwards. So here, there, well, whose older counterparts? Okay, so that means whatever's in the previous sentence, we need something that could be the older counterparts. Well, the yellow and white lines would be the older counterparts to them. So if I look where it is now, I look at sentence four, golden and red lions, okay, lions. So yellow and white lions could be the older counterparts, the red and yellow, golden and red lions, represent lively and bravery respectively. Okay, so where it is now, I'm, it's not a slam dunk and we always wanna be working process elimination because we're looking for the best answer, most logical, not just logical. Right now that seems good. After sentence one, okay. While there are many regional variations of lion dance costume, all make extensive use of symbols and colors. Well, there's no counterparts to the yellow and white lines in sentence one, right? That's the thing we need to have counterparts to. This there tells us that. 
And so after sentence one makes no sense, there's nothing that would be consistent with what we see in sentence five. C, after sentence three, green lines encourage friendliness. Okay, that's kind of a lot like sentence four, where it is now, because lions, lions, okay. Once again, I'm going to keep it, keep going. Now, after sentence seven, so if we look at sentence seven, black lions, okay, cool. We got, once again, these could be the counterparts. Black lions are the youngest, therefore they dance quickly and pay playfully. So most of the time when you do this approach, the first time through, there's only one answer choice that makes any sense at all. You see, their older counterparts, there would be only one sentence that could be the, the younger, the, the reverse counterparts to the yellow and white lines. Now, this is where the bigger context is important. This is where consistency is really important. We're looking for the one that makes the paragraph most logical, which means we need to have the most consistency. The sentence that we're moving here, sentence five, talks about the older counterparts. And so if we're going to want to be talking about the older counterparts, well, we're going to want to be next to something that would be related to that, would be a counterpart. Well, kind of gave it away. Sentence seven talked about the youngest lines. And in fact, we can go even further. What do we know about the yellow and white lines? They dance more slowly and deliberately. So that is a comparison. And comparisons are all about consistency. Well, more slowly and deliberately than what? Well, more slowly and deliberately than the black lines that are quick and playful. So which of these answer choice gives us the most consistency is answer choice D. So as you can see, there's a lot of specifics that we can go into just in this one question. Just because I'm going to be emphasizing these big overarching ideas doesn't mean you don't want to spend the time learning the details about the different topics, for instance, about the different kinds of questions that you see on the SAT or the ACT. However, on the day of the test, it's more important to remember, oh yeah, I care about consistency because not only, of course, does it help us eliminate B, but it's the reason why D is the best answer here because sentence seven is most consistent with what we see in sentence five. Now, we're gonna look at another question that's about consistency, but also about an entire paragraph, this time on the ACT. And this is definitely an example of a question that's much more common on the ACT than, what we, than, than on the SAT. So we got this massive, massive paragraph I had to be even put it on a second column because it just kept going. And we even got a long question. Now, the answer choices are obviously pretty short. Point A, point B, point C, point D. Like, pretty straightforward there. But one of the things, if you find you're struggling with time on the SAT writing and language or on ACT English, is you want to be thinking about your POOD, your personal order of difficulty. What are the questions I should be doing? And what are the questions I maybe I'm better off skipping, spending my time on doing other questions, but using still using my butter of the day. I'm not going to leave any questions blank, but still going on. It's like, okay, like, do I want to spend my time? And the nice thing about SAT writing and language in ACT English is that oftentimes the tip off is just which questions seem like they're a lot of work. I'm dealing with this entire long paragraph. The question itself is going to take me a moment to just figure it out. So if you're in that position, remember that strategically, it may make more sense. It may give you a higher score to take a question like number 10, pick FGHJ, whatever your favorite letter is, and move on to ensure that you get all the way to question 75. Now, of course, all of you tuning in, you're interested in the harder questions. So of course, I'm not gonna skip this. We're gonna do this question. So the writer wants to divide this graph into two in order to separate the general information about a groom's duties from the specific details about Eddie Sweat's work as a groom. The best place to begin the new paragraph would be at. So here, I think the question itself, okay, we wanna begin the new paragraph at one of these points. And if we look at it in the paragraph, we can notice like point A, 
point B, point C, point D. And it could be tempting to jump in and just go like, okay, where do I feel like, okay, it's breaking the paragraph in half? It kind of going too long if we wait till D, for instance. You might be like, oh, like, it can't be D. That's not the key here. We want to be consistent. And so obviously, whenever we're making a paragraph, so we want to keep the ideas within a paragraph consistent. This is taking stuff directly from your English classes at school. When you're learning to write a paragraph, you want to have your paragraph have some one big overarching idea. If you have too many ideas, break them into more paragraphs. Now, here, we don't even need to go that far because the ACT is giving us a clue in the question itself. It's really important to not only think about consistency when it comes to the content of the answer choices and the passage, we also want to think about consistency in terms of the question. Here, the question wants us to separate the general information about a groom's duties from the specific details about Eddie Sweat's work as a groom. So when I go consider these points, I know that I need to have before it this general information and afterwards the specific details about Eddie Sweat. So for instance, I go to point A, because you know it's our first answer, let's go to work process elimination. So the sentence before, a groom's basic tasks include washing and brushing the horse, bring its mane and tail, and they clean its hooves. Okay, well that's definitely general information about a groom's duties. Right? Groom's basic tasks. Now, after point A, a groom also cleans stalls and takes care of the riding equipment. That's still about general information about a groom's duties. So we can eliminate answer choice F because point A isn't consistent with what we're trying to separate. Answer choice B, okay, okay, sentence before is that sentence again. A groom also cleans stalls and takes care of riding equipment. Once again, we already determined that's general information. So that's a check mark for point B because we wanted general information before. We want to see, do we then go to specific details about Eddie Sweat's work as a groom? Those whom witness Sweat with Secretariat attest that his care surpassed the usual duties of a groom. Okay, we've mentioned Sweat and it talks about his duties that his care surpassed the usual duties. We don't get much in the way of specific details. But it seems like it could be doing the work. So let's leave it. And move on to answer choice C. So, sentence before. He'd talk in the horse constantly. He'd sue Goa, a Creole English language commonly spoken in the South African, South Carolina African American community Sweat grew up in. Well, he'd is Sweat. So we're not getting general information about a groom's duties prior to point C. And so even if we move on, well, we're already wrong here because it's not accomplishing, it's not consistent with the first part of this question where we wanted to have general information about a groom's duties because we're talking specifically about sweat. And then point D, he'd also examine Secretariat's teeth and take his temperature daily, attention to any signs of illness or distress. Okay, once again, he'd is referring to sweat. We want there to be general duty. And so we're left with answer choice G. When there is a question on both the SAT and the ACT, in these sections, when you have that question, pay very close attention to what the question's asking you to do. Much of the time, the work you need to do is there in the question. And so look for what they're asking you to do and be consistent with that goal. So now we're going to look at another question. This one has a couple of different things going on. First of all, there's no actual question. This is what we at the Princeton Review like to refer to as a proofreader question. Your job is not to do anything specific based on the question because, well, there is no question. Instead, your job is to determine which of the four answer choices, A, B, C, D in this case, is the the best answer. And by best, that means we want to be the most grammatically correct, the best punctuation, word choice, everything, but really focusing on errors. 
So we want to read the sentence that includes this underlying portion for this proofreader question. So it starts here. In addition, the anodes retained about 13% more of them than the conventional anodes, which meant that the batteries could provide more electricity before needing to be recharged than conventional batteries can. Now, many of it, you at home are probably looking at this sentence and going, this doesn't seem right at all. Um, we could even ignore question seven, because question seven also seems so. Um, cool. So let me go back to that. So it is G and not J, because point D, we need to have this general information about a groom's duties before point D. Point D before point D is about sweat. And what sweat did specifically with secretariat. So it's not general information. So point D is not separating the general information from specific details because they're both, we could even look afterwards, sweat would spend extra time massaging the horse's legs. Well, this horse is talking about secretariat. We're not separating anything. And specifically, we're not separating the general information from the specific details. So getting back here, it's really tempting to just eliminate answer choice A for question eight. The sentence seems terrible. I want to say that's even ignoring whatever is going on with question seven. Question eight just seems wrong. Most of you are probably like, oh, there needs to be a comma or something. It's a run on sentence. Yeah. It's really important that you don't eliminate answer choice A or F, no change, unless you know for sure there's a grammatical error or a punctuation error in this case. And the thing about commas is that not using a comma is rarely actually an error on either the SAT or the ACT. So what we want to do instead is look at what's changing in the answer choices and work process of elimination. And what I notice is changing. We have some punctuation, but we also have some wording. And so there's multiple things changing in the answer choices. This is one of the things that can make a question more difficult. Kind of makes sense. If you have one thing changing, it's just this one word changes, that's going to be a bit more straightforward to deal with than a question like question eight, where there's a lot of different things changing, and it can be kind of difficult to jump in and decide, like, okay, what do I do? So what you want to do is you want to jump in on the thing that's changing that you feel most comfortable with. And so depending on what you know, what you've learned, what you've mastered already as far as the content goes, that might be different. For me, I look at answer choice B and I know that a semicolon equals a period. This is true for both the SAT and the ACT. If I can use a semicolon, if answer choice B is correct, that must mean that I could also use a period. And I know what that means is that I need an independent clause both before and after this punctuation. And so I can do what we know we call the vertical line test. I'm going to draw it here in the answer choice because so much is changing. The words are different in the text that it makes more sense to do it here. So what I'm going to do is read the sentence up to the semicolon, see if that is an independent clause, a complete idea or incomplete, and then check the other half. If they're both complete, then answer choice B is looking really good. If they're not both complete, then there's no way it can be B because the rule for a semicolon is the same for a rule for a period. They need to be complete sentences on both sides of that punctuation. In addition, the anodes retained about 13% more of them than do conventional anodes. Okay, once again, that seven, question seven of them seems kind of awkward, but that's a complete idea. Afterwards, so meaning that the batteries could provide more electricity before needing to be recharged the conventional battery scan. Meaning that there is no subject verb at the beginning of this sentence. This is an incomplete idea. This is an incomplete sentence. And because I know that a semicolon is equivalent to a period, because this idea after the semicolon in answer choice B would be an incomplete sentence, 
I know that the answer is not B. And what I've also started to notice is that, okay, well, meaning, I can now say, okay, if I start with meaning, that's an incomplete idea. I'm looking at C and D, and they both start with this meant kind of after that phrase. So, in fact, what we see here is that we actually have some kind of punctuation stuff going on. So, for instance, considering we already know up to the word anodes in both of these versions is complete. The punctuation is changing, and that matters. Answer choice C has no comma but an and. So that's what we would call go punctuation here at the Princeton Review. Go punctuation, you cannot have two complete ideas, which gives me something to go on. I know that if what comes after this, this meant, et cetera, et cetera, if that's a complete idea now, changing meaning to this meant, that's wrong. Similarly, a comma is also go punctuation. And so I now have something as a way into these other two answers. I started with answer choice B because I was most confident about my understanding of the semicolon rule. It was very clear that, well, it's a semicolon. I know a semicolon is a period. And so I need to check and make sure, hey, does that work? Um, actually, no. In this case, it doesn't matter. In fact, the way they write these tests, they should not matter. So here, but in this case, it doesn't really matter. But you would assume that it's grammatically correct. They, they do spend a lot of effort writing the questions so that if you get question seven wrong, if you don't understand quite what question seven is supposed to be, it shouldn't affect your ability to get question eight correct. But that's a great question because obviously here it's confusing because seven presumably we're changing that because of them is we might delete it. We might just re or whatever. What 13% more what? of them is weird. I think we just need to tell it, say what it is. So now, looking at C, I'm actually going to look at C and D together in this case, because I'm going to say, okay, this meant, okay, if I start that second idea with this meant, what do I get? So, once again, this meant that the batteries could provide more electricity before needing to be charged than conventional batteries can. That could be its own sentence. This might be a little ambiguous because this, what is this referring to? But grammatically, this meant subject verb. I have everything that I need in order to have a complete idea, to have an independent clause. Now, getting back to actually answering the question, this is actually a problem for answer choices C and D. C is missing a comma before the and. If you have comma before one of the coordinating conjunctions, one of the fanboys, and and is the most common fanboys, if you have a comma before it, then you can use it between two complete ideas. Answer choice C does not have a comma. It cannot be the answer because it has two complete ideas, two independent clauses that are not properly separated with punctuation. So it's wrong. D has just a comma, doesn't have an and, a comma alone cannot separate two independent clauses. You may have heard of this as being called a comma splice if your teacher uses that language. That's what I was taught it. And so I need to eliminate D as well. And then that leaves me with answer choice A. Now, once again, I don't like the sentences written. Ignoring the of them, if I just get rid of it or whatever, this sentence still feels real bad. I'm not happy with the sentence at all. If this were a true editing test, I would be like, insert a comma here or rephrase the sentence because it is starting to get a little bit unclear what you're trying to get at. But we don't get that option on the SAT or the ACT. The only option we get is which of our four answer choices is the best. So here, making sure to use process of elimination. Don't just pick the right answer, pick the one that seems good but also look, making sure that you're eliminating things you know are wrong, certainly for your first pass, because sometimes you do have to go, okay, I have two answers left, which one's better, which is usually the most concise one, not always, we'll talk about that a little bit, but also 
okay, here I can eliminate B, C, and D because I know they're wrong. They break grammatic, they make punctuation rules. A is garbage, but it's it, it's the least bad garbage of the bunch. So now moving over to ACT, this is a question from December 2019. And so here we're going to see a little bit of what of our next rules or next things to consider after consistency. So once again, it's a proofreader question. We don't have a question. It's just four answer choices, A, B, C, D. Once again, if you're thinking about pood, the answers are kind of long. But as we're going to see, if you know what's going on, this question isn't so bad. So, in a studio in Dusseldorf, Germany, paint is what photographer Martin Klamas carefully pours onto a rubber membrane placed on top of an audio speaker. Okay. Doesn't seem to be great, doesn't seem to be terrible, it seems to be whatever. I look at my answer choices, and first of all, as I already mentioned, the answer choices are long. And second of all, I note that the word order is changing in every single answer choice. This is kind of like the sentence level version of that question that we did a few minutes ago where we were moving a sentence within a paragraph. We're moving all these words within this sentence. And so there is an element of consistency here, but it's really based on the idea, our second big idea, of needing to be precise in meaning. We need to make sure that the sentences have a precise meaning. And specifically, one of the things that you want to learn through your studying of the SAT or the ACT, regardless of which test you take, is how to identify what the question is testing based on what's changing in the answer choices. And so that's what I'm telling all of you right now. If you see word order changing in the answer choices, it's about being precise. And specifically, this is about the rule about misplaced modifiers. Okay, what, what do I mean by that? Well, a modifier is a word or phrase that's describing something. And it does it in such a way that it doesn't indicate what it's describing directly. And so it's a misplaced modifier because the grammatical rule is you need to put what's being described right next to what you're describing. And both the SAT and the ACT love to set up the questions exactly like this. In his studio in Dusseldorf, Germany, comma, you have an introductory phrase followed by a comma. Okay, so who or what are we describing with this phrase? Well, we're talking about in his studio. Well, who or what is in his studio? Well, presumably the person, right? I mean, grammatically, it's probably true that, for instance, paint is in this studio, but that's not what this phrase is supposed to be describing. That's not what the author's intending, because why? we don't care about the paint. The paint is not the point here. It's the, the artist. And so what do we need as the very next part of the uh, very first part of the answer choice? The photographer. We need Martin Clamas. And so A starts with paint. Not Martin Clamas. And so this is making this is making a modifier error. B, there is paint. No, well, that's not Martin Clamas. C, paint is so it's still not Martin Clamas. Photographer Martin Clamas. Okay, we added photographer there because well, that's another modifier that's modifying Martin Clamas. So it's in a good spot. D is the only answer that solves this issue. These questions, if you don't know what's being tested, if you don't understand that these questions are about creating a precise meaning by moving what's being talked about next to what's being described, the descriptor, the modifier, 
if you don't know that that's the rule you need to do, that you need to put these things next to each other, you can sit here and just try to sound this out and try to fill in each of these answers. If you know this is the rule, okay, in a studio, Dusseldorf, Germany, blah, 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 word order's changing. I know I'm looking for modifiers. Who or what is in a studio? It's the photographer. The only answer that does this is Steve. And so this is our second idea of precise. If you know you're looking out what's going on and the thing that's most important here is that the precision is because you're putting what's the descriptor next to what's being described and if you know that's exactly what's happening when word order is changing you can answer a question like 31 very quickly whereas most people are going to struggle and spend a bit of time so now still talking about meaning about being precise in meaning looking at question 37 from the March 2020 SAT. So once again, we're another proofreader question. We don't have any sort of question to guide us. We're just looking which of these four is gonna be the best answer. So let's look at the, th the question, sentence. After Greece gained independence in 1832, however, some argue that the agreement Elgin had made with the Ottoman government was now totally bogus and that the sculpture should be returned. Okay, so now meaning wise, I mean, sure, right? Some totally bogus. I guess, I guess that's maybe coming back with the new Bill and Ted movie. I don't know, but I look at what's changing in the answers, and I know these are all saying roughly the same thing. It's a matter of word choice. It's a matter of vocabulary. And so there's an element of being precise here. We want to have the right meaning, but there's also an element of consistency with the tone. Sometimes the SAT or the ACT will very explicitly say they want an answer choice that is consistent in tone with the rest of the text. But even if they don't say that, if you have a simple proofreader question, no question that goes along with it just for answer choices you still know that tone is something that you want to pay attention to so okay now totally bogus well i don't think that's something we would typically use in a history essay at school um it's not the typical sort of tone that we'd look for we can eliminate a because it's just a bad tone um, no, no longer valid. Okay, sure. Kind of works. It, it, it's not weird tone-wise. The meaning's right. Not okay anymore. <laughs> kind of like no longer bogus. We don't want to say it's it's not okay anymore. And, and and in fact, if we're talking about an agreement, saying an agreement was no longer valid, it's a bit more precise. Agreements are something that's be not like not okay anymore. Kind of like now I'm totally bogus meaning wise perhaps even a little bit further because we would say that an agreement is no longer valid it's just not applicable whatever saying it's not okay it's a little, little bit weird but either way the tone i think is the best reason to eliminate and now there's answer choice d henceforth bereft of legitimacy now vocabulary is important in particular on the sat College Word has said that they're not testing SAT vocabulary, blah, blah, blah. They're, if you look at the tests, I'm sure all of you at home know that have looked at a lot of practice tests. No, that's not true. There are definitely vocabulary words that are important. However, this isn't just an individual vocabulary word. What it is, if, if you know what these words mean, it essentially means the same thing as B. Um, it really means like, Henceforth is the same as no longer. Brift of legitimacy is valid. So here's an important rule for both the SAT and the ACT. If you have an answer that's fun and exciting versus an answer that's boring but correct, you want to go with the answer that's boring but correct. In this case, no longer valid says what it needs to say. It has the right meaning. We're talking about this agreement. 
and saying that an agreement is no longer valid is a valid way of phrasing it. Henceforth, bereft of legitimacy is trying to show off with its vocabulary. It doesn't match the tone. It doesn't match the writing style. And also, we can use our third big idea. B is also more concise. When you're down to two answers and you're not sure which answer is the best one, go with the most concise answer. Now, in both the SAT and the ACT, there are cases where, of course, where you need those extra words. For instance, if you're doing a comparison, you often need that or those to make the comparison correct. But if you don't need those extra words to be consistent or precise or to make any punctuation correct, don't use them. Short and sweet. Be concise. Now, I wanted to look at another SAT question because in some ways it's kind of similar, though obviously it's a different concept here. I don't have a lot of time with you all tonight, so I wanted to touch on a number of different things. So here, once again, we have another proofreader question, and we're seeing, okay, we got this sentence, we got to read this sentence and then see what's changing in the answers. The authors of an article published in October 2013 go so far to assign blame for the distortion of, to the newspaper industry. All right. So I look at my answers. Okay, so I see what? So changes to as. I have an as and a so, an answer choice D. C throws in this and. Here we have a bunch of these little words changing. So, like, as, so, bar, are all these prepositions? And is a, con is a conjunction, but when you see different prepositions changing in answer choices, these questions are typically questions that are testing idioms. Idioms are one of the most frustrating topics on both the SAT and the ACT, because by definition, there are no overarching rules that you can learn to know how to answer idiom questions. Idioms, by definition, are phrases that are the way they are because that's the way they are. The root of idiom is the same as idiot. goes back to the Greek, which actually means like just somebody who doesn't work in their public place. In other words, somebody who acts like they're... Just they do what they do because that's what they do and there's no rot logic to it. Idioms do what they do and that's what they do because there is no logic to it. Which is challenging because I can't just tell you a rule that will let you get this question right and every other question right. So what that means is this. If you're at home and you still have a ways to go, you still find that you're missing questions that are not idioms or vocabulary. So you're still missing punctuation questions. You're still missing grammar questions. You're still missing questions that are those editor questions, questions with questions. You are going to be much better off spending your time and energy learning those questions because you're going to see those questions on your test. The problem with idioms is you're not going to see a lot, maybe two or three, more likely one or zero. But when they come up, the best thing you can do is eliminate things that don't work according to your ear, get rid of them, pick something that's left. Now, if you are at the point where you're only missing vocabulary questions, you're only missing those these sorts of idiom questions, this is the time to start looking up lists of idioms, looking up vocabulary words going through your practice tests and looking up any idioms or any word, vocabulary that you don't know to give yourself the best chance on the day of the test. So here, the sentence is written, seems kind of like, okay, right? The authors of an article published in October 2013 go so far to assign blame for distortion to the newspaper industry. As far, kind of is the same. If I don't know the idiom, I don't know, like, 
so far, like A and B kind of seem like whatever. C, the authors of an article published in October 2013 go as far and to assign blame for this and does not make any sense at all. It does not seem right. There's don't doesn't seem a reason to include that. And so C, most of you probably recognize that C, just even if you don't know what the idiom's supposed to be here, it's not supposed to be C. So even if you don't know the idiom, if you have the time to invest, you can do what I'm doing, see whether it fits in the sentence and eliminate it if it doesn't. Um, and D, the authors of an article published in October 2013 go so far as to assign blame for the distortion of the public newspaper industry. Okay. It includes my both my so and my as, and they both seemed okay. And there we go. So now, if you're at home, you're like, I don't know which of these I would do. On the day of the test, what you should do is you pick. Pick your letter of the day. If C is your letter of the day, pick something else. Don't pick your letter of the day or if you're able to eliminate it. Pick your letter of the day. Move on. Don't agonize about this question. Obviously, if you're in the position where you're getting really close to getting all these questions right, you want to keep boosting your score, you're going to want to know that the answer here is D. The idiom is somebody did something to go... In this case, like it went so far as it usually goes with a form of the verb to go. You go so far as to do this thing. If you're still, once again, if you're still missing questions about punctuation, about grammar, editor questions, that's going to be the better place to spend your energy. Idioms are very frustrating because there's, in by definition, once again, there's no logic to them. What College Board and ACT are really testing is, have you read a lot of things? Because if you've read a lot of things, you'd probably feel like, oh, D seems right. I've seen, I've seen people write phrases, go so far as to, or went so far as to. That's really all it is. It's a convention that people follow because it's a convention people follow. It's unfortunate, but that's really as deep as it goes. And so once again, the bigger takeaway here is if you're not at the point where you're getting every other question correct, focus on those other questions. If you're at that point, learn these, memorize them, and you can check out lists. There's lists available out there. Um, I believe we have an article on College Confidential about idioms. Look at your practice tests and use your ear to sound them out, eliminate things the best you can. Now, flipping back to ACT, though this is a question that we see absolutely on both SAT and ACT, question 52. If the writer were to delete the preceding sentence, the paragraph would primarily lose up. Okay. Back to the editor question. Once again, we want to be consistent with the questions asking. Here, okay, we're going to delete this. If the author, the writer was to delete this, what would we lose? Okay, cool. Now, the trap that many students fall with a question like this is they start to focus very closely on the sentence itself. Now, the sentence itself is super important, but I want to point out that the question is asking what the paragraph would lose. And so, obviously, we need to read editor questions carefully to identify what we're being asked to do. But we also want to see the focus. In this case, we're deleting an entire sentence. But this is particularly important for those questions where it says, if the writer were to delete the underlying portion and it's just part of a sentence, check very closely. Are they asking what the paragraph would lose versus are they asking what the sentence would lose? Those two questions could actually have different answers. Here, of course, we're talking about an entire sentence. So we want to know what the sentence, what the paragraph would lose. So we want to know what the paragraph is about. Our answer choices need to be consistent with both what the sentence is talking about, of course, but also with what the paragraph is talking about, because we want to know what the paragraph would lose. So laws of symmetry, however, are valuable for the same reason, predictability. If a physical system behaves the same way, regardless of how it's oriented in space, then it's symmetric. 
if, for instance, an experiment yields the same result, whether it's conducted in the United States or Tuesday or in Thur India on Thursday, which has symmetry, it, it's, this is for those of you at home, it's going to be it has symmetry of space and time. So we care about this sentence, and we can see, okay, it's about this experiment. The experiment has the same result if it's in India and the United States and those different dates. So, so yeah, so here we can just, okay. Now, what's the paragraph about? <coughs> Excuse me. The paragraph, laws of symmetry. Physical system the same way, regardless of how it's, then it's symmetric. It has symmetry. So we need to be consistent that we're talking about this experiment and how it be it have symmetry if it's the same in these two different places at these two different times. But we also need to be consistent with this idea of symmetry because that's the topic of the paragraph. And once again, we want to know what the paragraph would lose. So A, scenario that demonstrates why experiments are often conducted multiple times. This is not really getting at the idea of symmetry. Yes, it's true for the sentence, it's being conducted multiple times, but it's not what the paragraph is about. The paragraph's about symmetry. F is not explicitly getting at that idea. G, hypothetical example explains the physics concept of symmetry. Hey, symmetry is good, hypothetical example. If, for instance, if is hypothetical in this case. And so, for instance, is an example. And then we get the example. This looks really good. It's consistent with both the sentence and the paragraph. And once again, the question tells us we care about being consistent with the paragraph as well as the sentence. Demonstration of how physicists study space and time. Not about symmetry. Summary of one of the studies, no main. Well, no, there's not anywhere here. He's elsewhere in the passage, but not here. Not consistent with either the sentence or the paragraph. And so when it comes to editor questions, it's easy to get too laser focused on the specific sentence, for instance, when the question explicitly calls out other parts that we care about. Make sure you're reading carefully for the scope for these questions in order to make sure that you can be consistent and answer the question correctly. And now for our final question for tonight, question 32, we're back at ACT, another ACT question, April, 2019. This is once again, another question type that we see this very exact type of question on both SAT and ACT. So, Given that all the following parenthetical phrases are accurate, which one, if added here, would provide the most relevant information at this point in the, in, in the essay? So, just like the last question, we care about the scope. We're talking about at this point in the essay. The question would be different. The correct answer very well may be different if instead it was asking for the most relevant information for this sentence or the most relevant information to set up the following sentence. These are questions that both the SAT and the ACT ask, but they also ask this. So what this means is that I need to make sure I check out the entire paragraph. I'll let you all know that this is the beginning of the passage. And so we need to keep in mind what's going on. We need to be consistent with what's going on in the rest of this passage. Apologies for my thing going a little bit wacky today. So, in crowded New York subway stations, violinists rarely turn heads, dance streets spin by unnoticed, and singers often serenade only themselves. But subway artist Ming Liang Lu, who in 2012 is creating his delicate work at the foot of a Union Square staircase, staircase attracts attention. He is a self-described master paper portrait cutter, transforming the centuries-old traditional Chinese art of paper cutting by focusing on an untraditional su subject, the human face. Um, yeah, so quickly this question, are weird words ever okay on the writing and language section? 
Absolutely, but they're typically going to be they're going to be the only words that work meaning wise in the context of the paragraph of the sentence. And so if you have a choice between a word that works, that's not a weird word and a weird word, go with the boring but correct one. There are definitely questions where and typically what will happen is that all of the answer choices will be kind of weird. Um, it'll essentially be testing your vocabulary vocabulary or sometimes there might be one or two non-weird words but they're just very clearly wrong um, so that's definitely the case that it's not you should always eliminate those sort of answers but when you have a choice between one of those sort of answers and a boring but correct answer go with the boring but correct one so here well what are we going on about in this essay okay so the first sentence gives us a, sets the scene new york subway stations but I noticed that both of these other two sentences are about Ming Lang Lu and his art. And what do I know about his art? He, he's focusing on an untraditional subject, and it's this Chinese art of paper cutting. So, once again, I need to know the context in order to know which answer is consistent with that context. I know we're talking about this particular artist and how his art is Chinese art of paper coming, but it's an untraditional subject, the human face. So, answer choice F, though he also teaches calligraphy at the New York Chinese Cultural Center on the weekends. I mean, cool, but there's nothing that's consistent with what's here. In fact, even the calligraphy is not paper cutting. So there's really, besides that, he's Chinese, his art is Chinese, and there's very little here that's consistent with what's elsewhere in the paragraph. That's not going to be an answer because it's really missing that consistency that we want. Gee, he claims that the noise of the subway doesn't bother him. Okay, sure. Not consistent with the topic of this paragraph, which is the subway artist and his Chinese art of paper cutting and its focus on the human face, which usually depicts animals and flowers. Hey, notice there's a couple things going on here. First of all, it's talking about this Chinese art of paper cutting, but also notice where this box is. Here's our idea of modifiers. A parenthetical phrase is typically a modifying phrase. It can be other things. It can be a definition, for instance. In this case, this is a modifying phrase. What is it modifying? What is it describing? The Chinese art of paper cutting. Is it also consistent to talk about what it usually depicts? Sure, because if they're going to talk about the that is subject is untraditional well then it's relevant to talk about what is traditional what is usual this one looks pretty good j an art that requires few few tools we haven't talked about the tools at all sure it's describing the chinese art of paper cutting but it's not relevant to anything else in the paragraph so it's not going to be good as h so when it comes to, so let me wrap up this question. So once again, we want to be consistent with what the question's asking and look at the context. And that's a great question. When it comes to studying vocabulary words, definitely focus, you want to focus on the words you don't know. If you really, truly know a word, spend the time on other words. Now, when it comes to vocabulary, one of the tricky things is that it's important to consider words not in just, do I know it or do I not know it? but really in three categories. So there's the words you know. These words you should spend no time studying. If you truly know the word, well, then you don't need to study it. The words you don't know, I've never seen this word before in my life. Okay, obviously that's a word you should study. The tricky thing and the thing that can often lead you to not getting nearly as much benefit out of the, op out of the operation is that you ignore the words you sort of know. These are, in fact, the words that are the ones to spend the most time and effort on. By words you sort of know, I mean these are the words you've seen before. You often have a sense of at least the context they're used. You might you often know that it's like a positive word or a negative word. But if someone were to stop you and say, hey, what does this word mean? you get stuck, or you can't give a really precise definition. 
the biggest, easiest games, the biggest games that are actually helpful on a test like the SAT or the ACT are working words you sort of know, oh, wrong direction, and making them to words you know. This is the thing that's going to be most beneficial for building your vocabulary for the purpose of a standardized test. Should you work on words you don't know? Absolutely. And it's totally fine if a word you don't know only becomes a word you sort of know. You've improved your vocabulary. But one of the things you'll see over and over again on both the SAT and the ACT is that they like to test the nuance of words, in particular in writing and language and in ACT English. In, for instance, the reading sections of both the SAT and the ACT, when you have those vocabulary context questions, those questions as, as it is used in line 63, the word malice means, those answer choices typically all mean something fairly different. On writing and language, on English, the answer choices tend to have similar meanings. If they are words you sort of know, they can be very difficult to distinguish because they might be like, well, I know these are bad things. And so, and then we want something that's a bad thing. I can't really do much with that. What they're actually testing is, do you truly know those words? And so that's where you want to spend your time. And once again, for the purpose of the SAT and ACT, it's much better to spend your time focusing on other aspects of the tests. This is where you should be spending your time once you have everything else really solid. If you know the punctuation rules by heart, you know all the grammar rules that are being tested and you can don't miss those questions, you're getting all those editor questions right. Once you're at that point, that's when it's time to start studying vocabulary for the SAT and ACT. It doesn't mean that studying vocabulary is a bad idea generally. And there are certainly other tests, for instance, if you take the GRE later wanting to go to graduate school, GRE loves vocabulary. There's a ton of vocabulary on that test. But for the purpose of the SAT and the ACT, um, you're going to be better off focusing on those other rules for the purposes of improving your scores here. All right. So I would like to thank everyone very much for coming out tonight. Once again, my name is Aaron Lind. I'm a star tutor here at the Princeton Review. We went over some of the most difficult ACT English and SAT writing language questions. I want you all to go away with these ideas of consistency, precise, concise. Think about those ideas, but keep in mind the ways that we saw how College Board and ACT can make these questions more challenging and what you need to do in order to nail these challenging questions on the test. I wish you all the best. Have a good night.